Look at that beard! Hey, you guys. How are you? Oh, great. You look so awesome. I tried to, I tried to get my nephew to be my little production assistant here. He brought all the things that I told him to bring outside to my sunroom, yeah. out to the sunroom, but he didn't plug anything up. So, so, so I had to go run and get everything and get my drink ready. Yeah. And, and get my drink ready. Oh, yeah. do, you need, do you need a few minutes? No, no, no. I'm okay. I, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to get this ring light at a place where it can. It you can, can get a ring light. Huh? You can get one. I can't even get one. Well, listen. My partner takes a lot of pictures, and he had a ring light. <laughs> so, oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. So, I got a boat coming somewhere from China. Oh wow, wow! And listen, and it takes forever. And you better hope that when it shows up, it's actually a ring light. Oh right, I know. <laughs> I ordered kind of like buying clothes online, you know. Right. I ordered a a home gym thing, like you know, one of these little one one machines that can do everything. It's a small thing, portable. And I was like, okay, I gotta start working out again. I gotta, you know, right. gotta get, into get it together. It. <laughs> They, they were supposed to send me this contraption that looked like this that can fold in half and had different strings on it that I can make the tension tighter or looser. Right. Well, um, what they sent me was a pink band <laughs> <laughs> that was balled up in, a, in a, like, like about this size. <laughs> and I, and I, I think I still have that outside somewhere. <laughs> and, it, and I was like, what uh, the heck is this? I paid $49.99 for uh, this. Um, wait, you're like... Sucker. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm trying to, because I, I want it to be outside, it's quieter because my, my nieces and nephews are over here. Okay. But the sun, because of where the sun is, yeah. it's causing me to be dark. very dark. Turn more so, that way, like a, away see. from the house. Or when you lean in. Yeah, yeah, when I lean in, it's there. Hold on, let me turn this ring like really bright. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. There you go. There we go. That works. Okay. That works. Okay. Right. Oh. Your shirt, your shirt is everything. I Listen, love it. I, and I was like, what am I going to, I don't know if you guys have seen any of these other things I've been doing in the summers, but I've always been with a, with a Florida sort of Hawaiian shirt on. Yep. <laughs> I'm trying to will myself <laughs> to, be, to be in a good mood. <laughs> I'm oh, really shit. trying. It's no. been so tough. It's been uh, so tough. I can't, for real, right? No that, shit. <laughs> right. Listen. If you had any idea what the last three days of my life have been like, Russell, like, oh gosh, you're getting older. You know, but at least you're, but at least you're in Canada, and you guys have some semblance of normalcy. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Hear you. Yeah. Yeah. you're good. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hold on, internet. She's, ha she's having issues. Uh, what are you I drinking? What are you drinking? Well, I made me a sidecar with some Hennessy. A Hennessy sidecar. You're some fancy. Well, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but I didn't put anything on the rim. My partner always drinks it with a, with a sugar on the rim, but I don't. Yeah. So, so mm. here's my. Wow. Considering uh, that you bought that expensive piece of equipment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I washed my hair for you today, and it's a whole lot of Dolly Parton going on right here. Listen, I just got out of a shower. I just got out of the shower, so I'm still like switching because of the, the shower to, <laughs> to outside. Russell, but, I love you. I'm sorry, but I did not take a shower for you today. <laughs> you stank at the time. You, you oh, my, oh my gosh, it's so great to see you guys' faces. It's <laughs> so great to see you too. Cheers, Russell. Thanks for doing this with us. No problem. Much needed today. Yeah, okay. Hey. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, how are you doing? I'm okay. You know, um, listen, like I, keep, I tell everybody, at least my family's all healthy. We haven't been affected at all by this COVID situation, with this, which is really more than you can ask for. Um, uh, you know, we all are experiencing all of these cancellations and, you know, I'm, all, I'm into February now, uh, things being canceled. Um, and so let's, you know, and I'm sure the Met is going to cancel in February too. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I, I wanted to ask you if you had any cancellations in Europe because uh, we can't get over there right now. No, I haven't. Any my, my European engagements were from April on. Good. Oh, April on. So okay. I'm sure I'll be able to get over. It's only four performances in two, twice in Berlin, one time three performances, one time four. Uh, oh, listen, at least I'll probably make some money. Um, and hopefully the restrictions would be done by then, you know? 
Yeah. Um, who knows? But what can you do, really? You know? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Gird your loins. I mean, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing. What are we? Yeah. Are we supposed to go to Costco and get a job? <laughs> I, I, listen, I, I think that's what we're supposed to be doing right now. I don't know. God has a God is trying to do something really funny. Yeah. And I don't know what it is, but, but I'm not laughing. I'm not, I'm like, um, hello. <laughs> right. I'm not laughing. I, I know, like my son always says, my son always says during his prayer, he says, God, I know the, the coronavirus is here. It's here for a reason, but take it away. But take it away because it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love him. Oh, so, gosh. So, yeah. He, such a great job with him, Russell, really. I, I'm trying. I'm trying. He's so I, beautiful. That pic, that birthday pic. Yeah. In front of that amazing cake and his yeah. smile. I mean, that smile could, like, light up a whole room. I just wanted to hug him. I don't even, like, he doesn't know me. I don't know him. I want to know him, Russell. Right. Well, we, we I agonized over what to do for his birthday for... Well, we were going to ask know. that, yeah. I agonized for a week, you know, here in Georgia and in the South, a lot of, you know, police come by and they do like drive by honk and turn on the sirens and that kind of thing. But I've been having conversations with him about the police, so I don't necessarily want the police at my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't necessarily want the police at my house because it might freak him out. Um, I'm sorry so I'm the, laughing, but that's, I mean, it's no, not that's really true. funny, but... No, yeah, I, no, yeah. I agree. I, listen, I laugh too. You know, what can you do? Because... It's like you want to be, kids like the police and the fire truck thing. You know what I mean? They like that. But unfortunately, I have to tell my six-year-old that there are some dangerous, dangerous sides to that as well. And people say, oh, well, that's too soon to have that kind of conversation. But I don't think so. I really don't believe so. I think we have to have those conversations as soon as possible. And there are, there are nice ways to go about it. Yeah. Um, and I try to do my best to make it as nice as possible. Yeah. But I think it's important that he understands that not every time the police is called is, you know, going to be a good thing, yeah. you know? Okay. Uh, and so that that's kind of the way, and, and then he said that, but why? And I was like, I I'm, then I get stuck. Like, I don't know how to explain. Oh, the yes. it, but, I'm sorry, but when we were kids, did we not do the same thing? But why? But why? Exactly. And after why, you just have to go, oh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so like six is, I think, we need to teach kids from very early on, not just about that, but about about communicating and how yes. to how to talk to to other people and not treat them as little mini things, but to treat them as as a great and not very advanced. Right. Russell, come on, and, and that's and that's the thing. I, I think a lot of parents wait too long for certain things, like be it disciplining the ki a kid or just teaching, like you know. For instance, if, if, if your kid sees you every time you get out of your car and somebody walks by you, they see you clutch your purse a bit more, they're gonna think that they need to be protected as well. You know, they yeah. need to be, make themselves a bit more protected. Um, I try to get him to express himself as politely as possible, but tell me what you're feeling. And I'm always like, tell me what you're feeling. You know, expre explain yourself. You know, uh, try to find the words to express yourself. Uh, and sometimes he does, he's really great at it, but when he thinks he's in trouble, he's, he does this cry thing that absolutely breaks your heart. He's like, I just don't understand. <laughs> it was like, oh, it, wait. it really, Daddy, it really breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry you have to have those conversations with your kid. I, you know, I'm sorry that we're in a generation where this still hasn't changed yet. I mean, that's, that's the most heartbreaking part about all that to me. So, I mean, what the hell? I agree, but listen, um, what, what can change? Like, let's be really honest. If okay. we're really honest, yeah. I know I told you I didn't really want to have this kind of conversation, I know. but let's have this conversation. Okay. We don't have to wrestle. No, 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 but let's have this conversation. Let's have this conversation. And that's what can change. And really, what can change? I mean, let's, let's think about it. There is nothing that is going to change. And I gave it, uh, one kid an example young black tenor, and I said, listen, if you've lived on a block or in a neighborhood your whole life, you know, and you and your neighbors always got along, uh, there was never any problem, you know, there was a little crime here and there, you know, petty crimes, a little crimes here and there, but you guys always got along and you guys loved each other. All of us, you know, the kids played out in the middle of the street, you know, hopscotch or, you know, whatever the case is, jumping rope. All of a sudden, a white person moves into the neighborhood. Um, he or she says, uh, why are these kids always in the street? They don't get it because one, they don't have kids. 
they're complaining about why these kids are always in the street, then all of a sudden they start calling the police, telling the police, these kids need to move from the street, they're making a mess, blah, 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 blah. And I said, then that white neighbor says, tells her one of her coworkers, I, have, I live in a great neighborhood, you know, my neighborhood is awesome. Then one of her white coworkers moves into the neighborhood, and then that coworker starts complaining about the fact that you have your dog out, you know? Then you get a situation where um, these people are coming into your neighborhood and then they're telling you the way you've always done things is wrong. Would you not do everything in your power to, fit, to fight against that, that change? Nothing's, things can't change. Things can't really or won't really change. It doesn't mean we can't fight for change. But I think, I think we have to be honest about what we're asking people to do. The world is built through, not just in America, and I get so tired of it being just an American thing. I say all the time, I love my country. But it's not just in America. Um, I think we have to be very careful with this situation that we don't, that we don't forget that everything in the world <laughs> is built through a white gaze. And this is, this is something that is very difficult to talk about, but I think that's the problem. And I think the, the only thing we can do is to try to live harmoniously, knowing that this is the case. White supremacy is the norm, right. and we want to just not have knees on our necks, you know, or be able to live in our neighborhood and walk our dogs without problems, or, you know, whatever the case is, go shop at the Publix without there being an issue, you know? Um, I think that's all anybody really expects. Don't make obstacles for black and brown people, Latino, Jewish people even. Don't, make, don't build obstacles for people um, and uh, let them live their lives. And I think that's, the, that's all we can really ask for. That's the only thing that I want to change. I mean, that's the only thing I think is possible to change. I don't think white supremacy is going anywhere. Because again, if, if I come and tell you you've been, what you've been doing for generations is wrong, you're going to do everything you can to fight against it. But I, I mean, I think that there's part of me that, that as a white person feels like there's a lot of people that I know that truly aren't educated. Does that make sense? They really don't understand because they haven't talked to you or tried to walk a mile in your shoes. They don't, they don't know. Does that make sense? Because they've been in a bubble, whatever that bubble is, whether it's a religious bubble, a school bubble, a, a, a community bubble, they don't know. And, and honestly, even in my own life, I didn't know I didn't know certain things about history until I was older. I didn't know until I had friends that explained things to me that I asked because I didn't know and they were gracious enough to talk to me about stuff. And I, um, I didn't, until I started educating myself, did I, right. that makes sense? And so I feel like, I feel, I feel like there's education and I feel like right now in our country, because there is a spotlight on this once again, cause I mean, there's been many spotlights in past generations, but right. there's something different, at least for myself, where I thought, you know, even in the voting booth where I went to just vote for the president or the vice president or whatever, I didn't really ever pay attention to the, to the mayor who, or who decides the governor, but with COVID and then in watching these things, I thought, holy shit, like, excuse my French, like I really need to pay attention to who is in power here because these are the people making decisions that affect a lot your of people. Everyday, your everyday lives are affected by municipal, by municipal politics. Yeah. And never pay attention to that. Never. I, I mean, personally, I'm very, I'm extremely guilty of that, but I know now, I know what's going on. And now that we're on social media, all these people have Instagram accounts. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you can actually, if you scroll through some of these things, even though they might not say what their platform truly is, because they don't really mm -hmm. want to say what they stand for, you start scrolling through social media and you can see who these people are all about. Oh yeah, what they retweet, what Absolutely. they retweet, you know? That says, a, that says a lot, even if they don't say anything, it's right. what they think is important enough to share with their people, even if they only have 35 people following them. Yeah. That, that what they share with those 35 people is very important. And I, I feel like- a lot about a person. Absolutely. Yeah. And Sandra, I, how have you found the, the difference? Mean, I know you guys are supposed to be asking me questions, <laughs> <laughs> but how have you found the difference of going to Canada? And I know you guys lived outside of the city, but how, how, do you, how have you found the difference going from America you're, you're from the Midwest, yeah? Yeah, I'm from Chicago. Yeah, and then going up to Canada. How did you find the, the difference? Well, I think uh, a lot of our, our Black Lives Matter is more here, the indigenous people as well. Yeah. Uh, we have, am I frozen? Yes, and yes. you look really funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love you. You look like you're about to ready to sing. 
in here? Right. <laughs> I'm so through here today. I'm so sorry. Oh, no worries, girl. It's all right. But I'll, but I'll tell you, I think we also have an issue with the indigenous people here up here in Canada yes. being treated inequally. And I'm sorry to say they were here first. Yeah. And, and it's the same thing in the states. You know, we don't, we don't, we're not even talking about that. And I and I re, I was doing an interview with somebody, and he said, "Well, what about?" I said, "Listen, all of those. Listen, when we talk about racism in opera, for instance, I know that my Asian friends have had a lot of problems, and I've heard people say some god awful things about Asian uh, my Asian colleagues. Right. Um, I know that some Latinx people have had problems. Yeah. But un but fortunately for them." Two things: the proximity for white helps. Uh, proximity to white helps them, and they've had visible champions like Placido Domingo for Latins, Placido Domingo Carreras, you know Aragon, you know they've had visible champions for many years. Right. Um, we have not. Black people have not had that. And Asians, although they nece haven't necessarily had champions, there's an idea. You know, people call me a tiger dad, <laughs> but there, there's ideas about. Oh, well, you know, Asians are great with music, you know, they play instruments, they, you know, these kind of things. They, oh, there's they, preconceived, you know, yeah. people have thoughts and it's up to us to take that yeah. out of our minds and reprogram ourselves and learn and educate as Carrie and I, we talk about with everyone. Yeah. And you have to be willing to make that journey and to talk to people about it and have these conversations like like we are with you and that you're willing to have these conversations. Right. And here's the thing too, um, you guys don't have kids, but you guys have been around people with kids. Kids are like sponges. Yeah. Everything you think they don't hear and don't they notice, do. they absolutely <laughs> notice. Mike, the fact yeah. that I, I told I tell, I, my, my kid overheard me telling my mom, you know, money's gonna be very tight in a couple of months, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and he, it, he's like, so Papa, you don't have any money? <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait. Well, you don't have to buy me that, you know, because you don't have any money, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it's that kind of thing. The things you don't want your kid to have to think about, to worry. They, they hear this and they, they receive this information, no matter how quiet you try to make it or how you right. try not to make sure that, and they feel and perceive all of these things. So like I said, if you're the, if you're the type of mother that you see somebody who you're uncomfortable around come by and you grab your thing and you hold it right. a, bit, a little closer, kids Catch that. Well, circling back, that's why you have to start with children at a at a young age. Yeah. Not only not only talking to them like like a person, not as a child, right? In their in their vocabulary, but also languages. It, all of these things, kids are like sponges, and they pick yeah. up on everything. And at a certain point, I think it it turns off. Yeah. And if you can get them now, they're going to live their whole lives with all of this information. Well, I'm really encouraged by the young people now. I mean, I'm encouraged by, they're really paying attention to what's going on, you know, in the government and the world. And we had a really exciting thing that happened here in Nashville with some protests, with some girls that just kind of met each other through social media that started a whole thing. And it was really amazing. And those are the people that give me hope that change is possible, even small steps and how that has to happen. And I mean, and I think even, that's beautiful. I love that. And, um, and honestly, like, I think the conversations like that you had with LA and I told you this, wow. that there were things in that conversation that I thought, Oh shit. You know, like I didn't think I was in my own lane looking at my own shit. I wasn't in a singer world in rehearsal and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at what, what Karen Slack was talking about. Does that make sense? Like there was yeah. an extra step to what I deal with that I went, oh my God, girl, I'm so sorry. Yes, I will move over, here's a chair. You know what I mean? And, and wow. how she was talking about it. And um, I really appreciated that conversation. And I mean, I know that it's a pain in the ass and you guys probably don't want to do it, but I would really love it if you did. Does that make sense? Because I think that, I think within our own business, there oh, yeah. needs to be that systematic change of who's hired. And um, even when you were talking about, what was his name? Uh, Af Afton? Um, Afton is her name, Afton. Oh, sorry, her about yeah. not being able to get a job and this, I'm like, why, um, hello, hello everybody that watches the Screaming Divas, you need to look into this girl. <laughs> and, this is, and this is the thing, I mean, I can tell you, she, I knew for, I know for a fact, she was living in Chicago and she was working for Joffrey, uh, Joffrey and, and I think at the Mexican American Museum were the two big jobs that she had got. And, and, cool. uh, and, and again, she had a, a history of raising money. She had all of this experience, you know, she had the actual evidentiary experience, you know, right. she could prove it. 
she had the receipts, as the young folks say, you know? Okay. <laughs> she had the receipts. Yeah. <laughs> but she applied for these jobs and she did not get interviews. And if you look ever on Opera America Jobs, you will see that in Opera America Jobs, there's always a, there's always, the most turnover is always in development. Because the development people can always go and get another job somewhere else bigger because they've raised the money. They, right. You know, if they've worked for Chicago Lyric uh, as a, a major grants officer or something, then they can go be director of development at Opera Memphis, you right. know, at right. a bigger, at a smaller company, but then they have, they have the top job. Right. Um, this happens all the time in these positions. And she had this experience and they would not give her auditions. I mean, they'd not give her interviews. You know, they, they just would not do it. And, I, and then it's the same, again, like I, this is something I've been talking about for years. It's the same when singers decide to hang it up. When singers decide they don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. I assure you tomorrow, if, if Carrie went to any opera company and said, you know what, I don't want to sing anymore. I bet you they would find a job for you somewhere. Yeah. I said to someone, I want to start doing admin part-time and I got so much blowback this one agent went on my on my Facebook and she just berated me. How dare you say you can do this part time? You can't do this part time. No, but I said, well, did anybody tell Francesca that? Did anybody tell Palacio that? Did anybody tell um uh what's the, the the young lady? I can't think of her name right now. She's an artistic director of some smaller opera company, but she still sings. Lauren Me oh, not Lauren Meeker. No, but Lauren Meeker, she directs, she directs yeah, and, and of them. that Who's company. Them? She's amazing. Who's this? Pat Reset. Pat Reset. There you go. And that's the same, that's the thing I, I, I'm talking about. We, when we don't get those opportunities or even to be a part of the discussion for those opportunities. Right. Uh, same with myself. I really would love to, and I took this job at IU completely, totally reluctantly, but I, but I wasn't getting any traction for anything administratively. I would love to run a young artist program. I uh, would love I, for you to do that. that. Yeah, oh my God, you'd be great. Well, listen, I've said, you know how, how long I've been saying this? I would love to run a young artist program. I'd sing less if I could run a good young, especially a nice young artist program. I'd sing less. I don't want to stop singing, but I'd sing less. Well, why? Okay, you have a drink. But what, why? <laughs> yeah, we all need to drink a little Tell people that what you're doing, because they probably want to work with you, what you're doing in the fall, and why did you want to pull back on the amount of singing? Well, I don't want to pull back on the amount of singing. I didn't stop... Uh, my okay so I was offered three or four schools at the end of the fall all of a sudden started writing me, and I didn't quite know what that was about um, I know that uh, Patrick Summers spoke to a couple of people and said well Russell's interested in other things th other than singing okay um, so people started asking questions and they I got a few very interesting emails I, I had conversations one I said no out the gate because it was a bit of a shit show excuse my language and the other, the other two, I said, let me think about it. And they were like, well, we'll pay you to come give a master class. Well, if you want to pay me to come give a master class, I'll go give a master class. Hey. You know? uh, <laughs> Those are uh, fun. Right. Or, or, or just, or come in and talk to us, you know, was it, which was the case in one place. So I did. And then when I got there, they were like, oh, would you sing something? And I was like, no, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing anything. <laughs> but, <laughs> but. to bring teaching. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so I said, no, no, I'm not going to sing anything, but I'll talk to the kids and I'll talk, you know, talk to you guys. And, and, um, and when I, you immediately said, we know you're singing, we, you know, don't expect you to stop. Don't expect you to slow down. Uh, the head of music, the head of the voice department said, well, I would like to know that it was a light at the end of the tunnel, blah, blah, blah. And I explained to him that my tunnel's still very long. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I, I still see myself singing for a very long time. Hope so. However, um, I find that it's better for us as artists when the institutions come looking for you. When we go apply for the jobs, it's like they have a bit more power control and you know, you know what I mean? Right. So I wanted to start building a relationship with an organization and I kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then whatever, I don't know what the reason was in February. I was like, yes, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this and it's very part-time. I'm teaching only part time. I have six students. Okay. That's, online or? Well, it does supposed to be online, uh, and it would, and the school would want them all to be online, but I don't want them to all be online. Whoa. I need to. There's some students that, especially I have a freshman 
there's some things in the physicality that you just can't see online. You just can't That's touch, feel, that. do online. And, and sometimes it clicks online and sometimes it doesn't. Finding that consistency. So I think some check-ins in person may be necessary. Um, and a few of the students were like, well, I don't want online lessons. And I was like, well, that's really not my, up to me. It's up to the school. The school said, if you, the, the edict is sort of, if you can teach online, you have to teach online. Oh, you have to? Yes. Yeah, they don't, they, they're trying to minimize people coming to campus at all. So you don't have to go now. Last time we talked, you were trying to figure out what you were going to do with yes. your client or whatever. Yeah, they, were, they didn't say, they hadn't, at that point, they hadn't made any decisions. Okay. But now they're saying, if you can teach online, you have to teach online. Okay, well, I'm kind of happy about that, Russell, because I don't, re I don't, I want you to stay safe. I don't want, can you just teach him in person in the spring when we know a little bit more? <laughs> well, but, are, but are we really going to know a little bit more in the spring? Well, we keep knowing more every day. I mean, there's more stuff that's coming but out. It's so. changing all the time. It, it, I don't know. I think it's just going around in circles. I feel yeah. like it's all this, this blah, 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 blah. And I think it's, a, here's the thing, I get it. I mean, most of the teachers at the school, and actually one of the older teachers at the school wants to teach her lessons in person as well. And so she's sort of been fighting back against that. But what? If, I were, if I were her, I wouldn't want to teach in person. I mean, and I don't necessarily want to teach in person because I have underlying health issues that could be detrimental. Right. But there's something about at least, I don't know, I don't know how many times I have to do it, but I have to go in and just be very careful, but have, lessons with these kids and just in a big okay russell thomas i'm sorry but you need to promise me three things <laughs> a big One, room with a mask on <laughs> a huge ass room two a mask three a visor, a visor cover and then i'll feel a little bit better and maybe an air purifier even though they say that doesn't work but that and, just makes me feel a little bit better probably want you to have a whole body condom on too i think yeah a whole body <laughs> condom thank you sandra well my, my partner and my, and my mom both would agree with you with the body condom absolutely <laughs> Well, so are you going to have to go to Indianapolis? I will. I will in the, uh, to Bloomington. But everyone keeps asking me, oh, when are you moving here? I'm, like, I'm not moving. I'm not moving there. <laughs> no time. No time soon. <laughs> no okay. time soon. Tell every, do you want to tell people where you live? Have you told people that? Before? I live in Atlanta. Okay. So what's going on there right now? It's craziness, right? It's craziness. Um, the, I live in a, I live in a, uh, a smaller city but it's like in the we have the atlanta metro area i'm right. in the atlanta metro area but not in the city proper okay my city is called south fulton and my mayor and council uh were one of the first ones in georgia to issue stay-at-home orders before the right. governor did right so they issued stay-at-home orders um they also issued the other day mandatory masks but then the but then the governor came out the very next morning and said no one has to wear a mask if they don't want to Oh, come on. And, and hold on. And my, and my word supersedes any municipality. So, 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 so the city of Atlanta and South Fulton have agreed, have, have issued these, these sort of a mandatory um, mask orders, uh, but then the governor came out the next day and contradicted them. So that's the kind of shit show we're living with here. I'm Georgia. sorry. The United States has to get their poop in a group, please. Yeah. But here's, here's the thing. Um, uh, Georgia is a very Republican state and, uh, and people don't want to admit this, but Georgia was doing very well with testing. You know, they were testing about 20,000 people or so, you know, 17,000 people or so a day. And, and, it, and at, in May, the numbers had gone down from like 800 a day of uh, confirmed cases to 560, 600, 650. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden in the in middle of June, those numbers went from 600 to 2400 2200 a day confirmed cases now we don't have a lot more hospitalizations but we do have more confirmed cases yeah so and we're they're, they're not testing more people so the president's you know if you do more tests you're going to get more people yeah, they're not right. testing any more people no. they're testing the same you know 11 to 15,000 people a day and and then the numbers have gone from being only 700 people confirmed now to 22 25 2600 a day confirmed yeah, there's a number, it's called a percentage rate or something that they're calling it, and, yeah. and it, it, per 100, 100 people, the percentage yeah. of people, and, and those percentages are just going through the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and again, I'm from Florida, and so I've been watching, and my grandmother is still living in Florida, and I'm watching everything that's happening in Florida, because I have a lot of my family living in Florida, and, and to the fact that they had 15,000 confirmed cases in a single day, 
yes on Sunday? That's crazy. It's crazy. Can I tell you a statistic I heard today? What's so that? the whole population of Canada is just about five million more, five to ten million more than Florida. A whole population of Canada. Yes. And Florida it has something like three times the amount of cases than Canada. Yeah. Just Florida has three times the amount of cases of all of Canada. That's craziness. It's craziness. Like if we have to wear a mask here and it's a $5,000 fine per incident. Do you so, still have your parents? Yeah, my, my mom lives with me. She's, thank God, because she, she helps me with my kid, you know? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, lucky Matt, kid, Matt, lucky kid that he gets his grandma. You know, yeah. how cool was that? And all the grandkids are here today. They've been here for, for about a week now. So yeah, my, yeah. Oh, oh my, oh, wait a minute, how many children? Uh, it's a total of four. Are you like, please leave my house? <laughs> no, no because, because when uncle says, shut up, everybody shuts up. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so like, I'm like, hey guys, I need quiet, I'm teaching a lesson. You know, I need quiet. <laughs> and, they, and they're really quiet. My pianist came over because I'm doing one of those LA opera recitals. Yeah. And she said, we've been rehearsing that, yeah. for three hours and I haven't heard a kid. I said, because they know uncle's working. <laughs> we okay. have to be quiet. <laughs> we Talk have to, to be about quiet. that. Talk to us about the, what you're doing with LA. Yes. Um, you know, they have this uh, opera at home series um, where they have people doing at home recitals. Um, I don't know the official name of it. Forgive me, LA opera people. But I, I think, think it's opera. What was that? I think that's what it's called, the LA at home. Yeah. LA at home, yes. So um, they, they asked me to do, these, do this recital. They asked, they asked like two times and I was like, eh, no, no, I don't know, Josh, Josh, but they've been so good to me, you know? And, I, and uh, it's taken a, a, taken a lot of energy for me to muster up the will to sin. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I finally decided to do it and I started, you know, going through and singing the 24 Italian songs and arias. And then I started adding an aria in. And then, and then San Francisco said, oh, could you sing one of the Ernani arias? And I was like, oh, I sang that for them, recorded for them. But that was so hard. Ernani, was- difficult. Is that the first thing you did coming back singing? No, yeah. right? And I, sang the, and I sang the aria that is always cut, the Odile Volto. Oh, uh, my God. But I was supposed to do it with a cavaletta, but I just decided, no, thank you. There will be no cavaletta. <laughs> You're lucky you got this four-minute aria out of me. <laughs> because, I mean, and here's the thing. My voice feels fresh, but my right. body does not know what to do with it. Right, right. If there's this coordination that's missing. Yeah. You know? But we can get to that later. But yes, that- I'm singing, I'm singing the, a recital for LA Opera. I'm doing... The biggest thing I'm doing is Knoxville Summer of 1915 because it's oh, a perfect, perfect at-home thing. Yeah. But I, but I learned something when I was working on the San Francisco Opera uh, recording is that I don't want to have a pianist somewhere else okay. and me try to listen to it um, because I need that support and it's not giving me that. Right. And if I need to push the tempo, I can't. You right. Know, so the, yeah. So this wonderful pianist, uh, Kyungmi Kim, who I know here in Atlanta, mm-hmm. is coming over. She came over to my house the other day. We rehearsed. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll go to her house tomorrow to rehearse. Okay. Um, and then she'll come back over again two more times. But uh, we'll, we're going to play together. And, and hopefully it's going to go well. I'm going to just you know, sit down in a chair and sing and just make it very informal and Love talk it. a little bit and see what happens. So do you record it on an What do you record with? Do you have a mic or do you just use your well, iPhone? It's going to be live. But I, I have a mic. I have a mic that plugs into my phone. It's, oh. it, it goes directly into the iOS, and it, and I don't know if you guys heard the uh, the uh, the San Francisco thing, but it makes a really beautiful sound. The little mic that I have. But, okay, so Russell, how did you become an opera singer? Oh Lord, I never <laughs> asked you. I never asked you this, and I really want to know. Well, I don't listen. I. Well, he, this is the way I, I discovered it. I mean, I came home one day from school, at grade school. It's a story I've told a million and one times. But I came home one day for grade school, and I, um, and every day when I come home from school, nobody was in the house. So I turn on the radio, and I'm flipping through the channels, and I hear people singing kind of funny, and I stop. I just hear this noise. I said, what is this? And I kept listening, and I sat in front of the radio, and I listened to it for a long time. And again, I, at, back then I didn't know what it was, but I heard the same music again later. And it was like, bing, that's what it was. It was Freischutz. Oh, cool. Wow. No, excuse me, not Freischutz, Oberon, Oberon, Oberon. Same composer, different, different piece, Oberon. And it was with 
Placido and uh, Beard Nielsen. And uh, that's what I heard for the first time ever in my life. And the next day, I came back again to listen. And it wasn't opera play, but you know, every day they were playing classical music on this radio station, WTMI in Miami. They would play until nine o'clock and then it would become the jazz station. You know, yeah. it's like, it was like ah. classical music until nighttime and then we get a little risky. <laughs> we do, do a little jazz. You know? going on. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, but I don't know if that's when they were changing it. But anyway, so I would come home from school and I would listen. You know, I was in a very religious household. So we didn't really listen to, you know, a lot of, especially when my grandmother was home. You know, we didn't yeah. listen. We didn't listen to pop and, you know, rap no. and that kind of stuff. No. So um, I turned it on and I, and I fell in love. Um, I was got to high school and um, this uh, mental soprano named Joy Davidson had just became the head of the voice department at this school, Newell School of the Arts. Yeah. They had a high school training program. And I always wanted to go to the high school. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, no, it was too far away. And I, take, like, I would have to take like a public train. And she was like, uh, absolutely not. You're not going to okay. go. You're not gonna go to that school. Um, and Joy came to my, my high school and uh, was, were listening to kids sing their solos for Florida Vocal Association. You know those things, Karen. Yeah. yeah. Vocal Association, you know, you do the FVA, you know, right. you do excellent you know yeah. or uh, superior honors you know <laughs> um uh things and she was helping me helping students with solos and i started singing and about you know 10 seconds in she said have you ever thought about being an opera singer and my whole i changed my whole life well that wow. that moment changed my whole life we and everything i thought i was going to do with my life i said no i'm not going to do it i'm going to be an opera singer we thank her for that yeah I tell her all the time, I'm so, I'm so thankful. And I, and I was the runt of the group. I came in as a freshman and I was so shy and I didn't know who I was in sexuality. Shy. And it was all of the, what's that? You were shy? You're very, 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 very shy. I was so shy. I was afraid to speak. I didn't want to sing in front of people. And, and it was just a whole thing. Um, and she used to do all this crazy shit to try to make me like, <laughs> like I would be singing, I, I'll never forget singing O Sole Mio, you know, singing O Sole Mio. And, and people were like, you know, acting like they were on gondolas, you know, so <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> just to get me to like loosen yes, up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. But um, I don't know if it worked, but it definitely made me love singing, you know, even that's more. Cool. Yeah. So that's how, that's how it all started. Wow. And so then, okay, you went from there. Then I, I, at the end of my undergrad, I decided I didn't want to go to grad school. And I just, I remember when I was in undergrad, I started singing for, I would go do every audition around. And I'll never forget my, my colleagues in, uh, in undergrad, they were like, oh, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. You're not ready for that. You know, why are you going to sing for those people? And I would get hired, you know, or they would be like, come to my young artist program. And I was like, I still have school. <laughs> you know, I, I still have school. And, and I didn't know shit from anything, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and um, and after a certain, I met this woman, Elaine Rinaldi, I don't know if you guys know her, conductor, coach, uh, and she started coaching me. Um, and she said, you know what, why aren't you taking these opportunities? And I said, the next one I'm getting, I'm gonna take it. And it was Opera North. Uh, Opera North in New Hampshire, and they paid $100 a week. <laughs> and I was singing chorus and scenes and stuff in the summer. Uh, and then from there was Sarasota, then St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then it just went, it was like one after the other after the other. And then it ended up the Met. And so that was in 99 that I went to Sarah to, to um, Upper, Upper North. And by 2003, I was in the Lindemann program at the Met. Cool. So in four years, I was at the Lindemann program at the Met. Now we've, you and I, we've sung both Tosca mm -hmm. and Roberto Deborah and Norma. And Norma, yes. Amazing. Two completely different vocal styles. And yes. And I have to say, I, I could not pick my favorite amongst the three that you did because they were all utterly brilliant. Mm -hmm. really. Thank you so much. Not just vocally, but persona and the character on stage. Uh, your polione is impressive. Yeah, but, I love the role. And it's such a thankless part. But I love that role. It is. It is thankless. Yeah. <laughs> that, oh, I'm sorry, Deborah. That's a pretty thankless part, too. Yeah, it's, it really is. It and really is. that was your role debut. Yeah. And you knocked it out of the park. But Thank you so much. Honestly, two different, completely different vocal styles. Do you think that as a singer, it's a good idea to keep different repertoire in, you know, in your bag of tricks? Or do you think that 
different vocal styles can can hurt you or help you or well here's the thing i think we we can find uh, examples throughout history that it worked for some alfredo cross sang maybe seven eight roles his entire 40-year career he just sang those same roles over and over again and he did them to perfection yep. um that would bore the hell out of me that would i would be very bored yeah me too. um even if i only sang verdi which i love i would be very bored i need to do something else so for me, I think it's important just for, just to keep the chops up music, in music with my musicality and being able to do musicianship, being able to do different things. I think that's very important. And also I think we cannot afford as modern singers to be specialists in anything. I don't think we can afford to do that because the, the world moves so fast and there are so many different um, facets to what we do. I don't think that really works anymore. There are some people who can because they have specialized instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, if you sing Wagner and only sing Wagner, then that you sort of have a thing. Right. You, know, you sort of have a lane. And usually the Rossini guys, you know, they sort of have a lane. Yeah. Right. You know, but in be everything else in between, I don't think we can do that. Um, so I don't think it, it, I think it can hurt you. It was, it's the same thing where people say, well, do you think all young singers should sing Mozart? I'm like, no. No. No, I don't think, I think, Every singer should be able to, at some point, sing something of the Mozart repertoire, at some point. But to say young singers should all sing, no, because if you don't know how to sing, Mozart can screw you up just as much as singing Wagner. Yes, it can. Yeah. You know, we, again, there, there are some very, you know, prominent examples of that that we saw that, you know, the business told certain singers to stay in this lane for so too long, and their voices sort of just like fell out. Right. Um, and then they changed and they did something that the business would also tell you that it would kill your throat and they're having huge success in it. Yeah. You know, they're, they're examples of that. So I think you just have to sing whatever feels good in your throat. And, and I don't prescribe to any I, you know, set ideas. I sing new music. I sing Mozart. I sing Verdi. I sing Bel Canto. And, I'm, and I was going to go into start singing heavier Wagner stuff, uh, starting with Parsifal, which was canceled in Houston. And oh. then... It's uh, then Tannhäuser, which is coming up in a few years. But I want, Tannhäuser is the only Wagner I've ever wanted to sing. I think it's the perfect opera. I think it's the absolute perfect opera. It would be brilliant in it, Russell, honestly. And, and, I, and it, it has its challenges. I've been learning it for a year now. Like just, I'll take a page at a time. And I'll just sit down and I'll sing it a page at a time. Sort of the same thing I did with Otello. Well, I was saying, you find it, is it a lot different vocally than Otello? Yes, yeah, yeah, because Although people sort of bark it in the middle, Otello needs you to be barked in the middle, but the Wagner stuff doesn't. Mm -mm. It needs you to sing in the middle. The orchestration's denser, it's heavier, but I don't think it, but barking is not gonna make the orchestra, you cut through the orchestra anymore. No. no. Otello's sort of written in a certain way that it needs that sort of, okay. it needs that bite. And I don't really do that very well. So when <laughs> I found myself doing that too much is when other parts of the show suffer for me. Right. The, lyric, the more lyrical moments that come after Act One oh. sort of suffered for me because the, the emotion is so intense that you kind of want to give it a lot. Right. Uh, you start doing that. Um, when I start doing that with my voice, my voice is set up in a very lyric voice, a very okay. lyric voice, but it can put out some sound. Mm -hmm. And so when yeah, people a lyric voice with a with a bite to it, you yeah. have you have a bit of metal metal to it, and and it cuts through, but. Essentially, I would agree with that. And that's what your voice likes doing are those beautiful, yes. long phrases. Yeah. yeah. And so Act 4 and Act 1 of Otello were like my bread and butter. The quartet in Act 2, <laughs> no. amazing. You know, uh, Act 3 trio, amazing. Okay. But the things that required this sort of, you know, that yeah. sort of park and bark or, you know, balls to the wall kind of thing the whole time, right. after about a good... I don't know, after a good few minutes, it, I start to feel it. Okay. And I don't like that feeling. So I, I, it's not a role that I will, I will sing a lot more of because it's, I, I know it's not, it's not sort of the thing that I'm, I'm built for. Okay. I'm built for the long lyric lines. I'm built for finding the piano high notes, you know, that kind of thing. You know, the end of Norma, for instance, like that's, that's duet, you know, that kind of stuff. There, no other tenor wants to ever sing quiet, but it's written all through the <laughs> piano, you know? Thank you. Remember the first day of rehearsal, you sang a piano, and I was just like starting to cry, going, "Finally, yes!" 
But it's, it, you know, I remember seeing, it's also, we have, uh, I, t I say this a lot, but look at Otello, the score. There are all these P's written every time this man sings. But the orchestra, like the, the conductors, like, you know, they yeah. have that orchestra ripping. Yeah. And I remember one conductor saying to me, um, I said, but look, it's all these P's. And he said, but no one wants to hear Otello sung with, with pianissimos. I was like, well, I, you know, I want to sing it that way. That's the way, in my ear, Vickers is singing it that way to me. Right. You know? That's what I want to do. When you, when you just made the decision to do Otello, and then, you know, you know, when you're learning it in a studio, it's so way different until you're on stage with an orchestra. And I don't know about you, but me personally, there are some roles where I thought, I don't know about this, but let's, can you get, put me somewhere where I can try it? Just because I needed to know what it felt like to move, to act, and sing this in my body over that amount of sound. Because there's nothing that prepares you for that in a coaching, in a room, whatever, for at least for me personally. So yeah. there's some things I thought, oh girl, I don't know if you should have done that. <laughs> um, so was that for you with Otello? Not, not that you shouldn't have done it, but Otello, like, I didn't know that I, I wasn't sure how this was going to go until I first sang with the orchestra. Because that kind of was like more of a first... Was that like one of your, the first big thing that you did? Well, see, big is all relative. Big is all relative. And I'll, I'll put it to you like this. What I did was I, um, I told the agent and people who were asking them before I do it, I want to sing it in concert first. Okay. But for me, it was important to sing it in concert first. Okay. Now, with that being said, just like you say, when you put something on its feet, it's completely different. Right. Concert was completely different than wearing, wearing, you know, 30 pound coat and, right. and dancing around stage. Absolutely. And concert, I felt like it was a piece of cake. <laughs> like, I, at one point, I think I, I crossed my ankles when I was sitting there <laughs> on stage. I was like, good, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this, this is a piece of cake. Okay. And I remember, and I remember Evans Mirage is coming backstage. I was like, and he says, please try not to cross your legs like that again. It looks like you're so relaxed. Evan. <laughs> and I was like, it was so <laughs> easy. Yeah. It was so easy. But then I got to Toronto and there was, there, it had its own challenges. You know, okay. I was with a conductor that had never conducted that piece, uh, which was, I think, in my opinion, the biggest mistake of the whole thing. Okay. Um, uh, and to be in that situation um, did not make it easier to sing. Although those first, and I did eight performances and there, were only, there was only one night that I felt like I couldn't sing. I couldn't okay. sing this piece. Okay. You know? That was maybe the fourth performance in, you okay. know, and they had the cover come to the theater and the whole thing, you know, um, but I don't cancel, you know, I don't, I don't care what happens. I don't cancel. I know. Right. And then I went after, after that, I went to Berlin and I sang four, three more, three, three more performances. Okay. So that was, that, you know, that was 11. Then I was supposed to have this, I was supposed to have this summer free. Then all of us, then before the Otello run started happening, um, Salzburg Festival changed their the artistic team for Idomeneo around. Mm -hmm. So then I had to do Idomeneo. And I thought, yeah, going from Otello to Idomeneo is not no big deal. But then <laughs> between Idomeneo, which was a fairly new role, and Otello, I had to rehearse. I had to have four prova for my first Alvaro in Forza. Oh, okay. So, That's completely different shift in gears. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> Sorry. That's like, what the fuck, Russell? What? Like, who planned that? That's a hot damn mess. Is, oh, you did? That wasn't Michael? Because that makes me want to just call and yell at Michael. <laughs> All the artists out there learn, do not do that. But, but the, it wasn't just, it wasn't just that, it, uh, Carrie. It was that after I did these, okay, I had these four programs for two weeks where I was singing uh, Alvaro, mm -hmm. and then I was still working on uh, Idomeneo because I had to get it, the Idomeneo recits memorized and did stuff memorized. Then I go get to Salzburg and I'm singing this uh, Idomeneo. Then for six weeks, I'm only singing Idomeneo. Then I have to go back to Alvaro. And I literally finished a Idomeneo performance, flew to Berlin. The next day was rehearsing Alvaro. And then I had like four more weeks of rehearsals. Uh, and Alvaro was great. I think, I think it's the best role I've ever done in my life. I, just, I, think it, I think it was the best role I've ever done in my life. And it was beautiful and I could sing it. And, 
and the challenges that other singers get from it, I didn't get those things. Um, and then after singing at Alvaro, I had three weeks off, mm -hmm. and then I had Otello again in uh, Washington. Okay. Those were the performances that I should have, I should not have done, You're because there were there was not a single performance in that I thought was good. Uh, okay. A single performance that was any good. I was tired. Your vocal, was, your vocal cords like jumped out of your body and smacked you across the face. Yes, a few times, <laughs> a few times. I was tired. That's I, okay. yeah. I was tired. And I knew it at the beginning because at the final dress rehearsal, I was, I was just saying, by the time I got to DC, I actually had a conductor that knew Otello. Like, he knew oh, Otello. Yeah. But I was tired at that point. You know, yeah. by the time I got there, I was so exhausted. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do? I, I, I told everybody one day um, before the final dress, I said, I'm only going to sing when I have to. Right. I'm only going to sing when I have to. And then I, and then I, I marked the, the final dress and they were like, oh, that was so moving. It was so beautiful. We were like, don't play with me. Don't play this game with me. Because we all both know that I can't get on stage and sing an Otello like that. <laughs> and sing an Otello like that. It's just <laughs> not, you know. It's yeah, just the not that killed you. <laughs> I, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not, um, anyway, I was physically tired. I sang 17 performances of Otello in a calendar year. Oh, oh so you're not never doing that again, ever. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm only singing, I only have one more Otello on the books, uh, <laughs> and everybody else I'm saying no, unless they can pay me like a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> so, so that's, it's gonna so, happen. So, so, <laughs> so that's gonna happen. They're gonna be like, <laughs> But I, I'm, yeah, I have one more in the books uh, at Covent Garden, and I think that's an important one to do, and, and, I, won't, and I won't do it anymore. Can I say, when you put it out to the universe, you put this big no out, it is amazing how everything then comes back. You say, no, 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 I'm not going to sing it anymore, and then you get 20 offers for Otello. Yeah, like, but, but see, the thing is, I've been, very good, I've been very good with that, because what happened after people knew that you can, I can sing it, you know, they knew, I'm, and I'm not canceling, and I can, and I'm not like halfway through the night with no voice. Right. Um, uh, it's just a feeling that I get at the end of the night. You know how you, you sing something and you're like, that felt so good, I can do it all over again? Right. I have never felt that way with a tell. <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've never come off stage feeling like, I can do that again. Even, remember, I was telling Carrie when you, when you stepped away the first time, remember when I was in, we were in Chicago doing Norma and I, so was I having the acid reflux issues? Yeah. Reflux or allergies, you didn't know what it was. Yeah, but it was, it, it was reflux. When I went to the doctor, I finally realized yeah. it was reflux. And I was still like getting and doing every performance. And I was like, I knew I could still sing Polione with those limited resources. But there were some times it was scary by the, we got to the end and we were like looking at each other like. There are a few oh. moments where like, <laughs> right. I'm grabbing your hands going, Russell, are you right. with Russell? Right. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> But I never felt like I couldn't do it. Right. With something like Otello, even if it were a good performance, great performance, yeah. at the end of it, I feel like that was a lot. And I don't like that feeling. Yeah. Well, and, and you know what? Life is short, and I'm frozen again. Life is short. <laughs> oh, Sandra, she's having a day. I'm having a day. This is, but what advice then would you give to young artists? With this in mind, what what things do you want to be talking to young artists out about technique? Well, I see. I don't think it's necessarily a technique issue. I mean, your Rita. singing should be the most efficient as possible. I mean, that's the one thing. Even as I'm trying to te figure out how to teach people, and uh, I think trying to get out of the way of yourself. We have, especially the longer we've been studying, mm -hmm. we have all these different opinions about our throats from other people, and I find that these 22, 23 year old grad students have so much information. A lot of it is very bad information, but they have so much information going on in their heads. So you tell them to just say, yeah, 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 they go, and nothing ever comes out. So right. <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I'm like, and so I stopped them. And I'm like, what are you doing? What's all, what is all of this? Like, what is all of this stuff you're doing? Yeah. Like, well, this teacher told me to do this, and this teacher told me to do that. And I was like, listen, for all of that stuff, forget yeah. about everything somebody told you, and just sing as naturally as possible. Your throat will tell you when you need to make an adjustment. Like, wait, till your, wait, wait for your throat to tell you you need to make an adjustment. Don't make arbitrary adjustments, because you're going to get all in your head and do all this stuff. And, and so far, it works, but I, I find that I spend 30 minutes of every lesson with somebody telling them how to get out of their way. 
you know? True, isn't just, it? That yeah. and support, right? Yeah, and support, and support, yeah. It's like, get out of your way, like, what are you feeling? Like, explain to me the mechanism and this kind of thing. But I, I think the, the most important thing, I learned a lot that, that uh, last year, 2019. I felt like a lesser artist would have been broken by that uh, situation. I thank God for some semblance of a technique that I know how to use and that's sufficient. Um, uh, um, because I, if I didn't have that, if I didn't have that, I would be dead right now. I would be dead right now. COVID is a blessing, but but I listen. But I, in January, February, I sang my first Rodimus, and it was also it was amazing. It was great. It was like a piece of cake. But I guess after singing 17 performances of Otto, everything's a piece of cake after that. <laughs> <laughs> everything's I mean, a piece of cake. For you, I mean that is. That, yeah. I would pay a lot of money to see that too. But so you yeah. learned. You learned how far you could push yourself. Yes, and I never want to do that again. Okay. And I never want to do it again. I find this whole conversation so interesting because I feel like between the two of us, there were similarities, especially with the Mozart repertoire. I mean, I did Rossini too in the early on, but Mozart for me gave me such an amazing foundation that when I did go into the bigger repertoire, Mozart's what I always came back to, even for vocalizing things that would bring the voice right back into the pocket that it needed to, that kept me healthy and safe so that I could sing long things of Tosca or long runs of Butterfly or whatever, but I would always have to come back. Even, I mean, when Sandra and I were doing where, uh, Yennefer, where I totally screwed it up in preparing it and it was really harsh on my voice, I went back to Mozart to fix it, and then I could sing what I needed to sing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I always thought that about you. I thought, okay, because he had this foundation of this kind of repertoire, he could always go into the heavy and then come back out of it and sing something like Idomeneo, but... I feel like from this conversation, you wouldn't agree with that, or you wouldn't. Say well, I, I would. I, I mean, I, I. But I don't think it's necessarily that that I needed to go back to Mozart. I need to go to higher things. My voice is built oh, high. Okay. It's a high. It's a. It's a. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just a voice that's just sort of built high. You right, know. Right. Um, so whenever I Otello just sits low, like it's the whole thing sort of grovels a bit low sometimes. Yeah, it does. Even though you have like these these periods of you know high high singing. But for the most part, it's e e e. You're banging on e e e e e e e e right. the whole time. Awesome. Right. It's like ora per sempre a Dio, Santa Memoria. It's like all of the da 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 over and over. You're banging on this this area over and over and over again. Right. So by the time you have to go up to um, questo fin, questo fin on a B natural, that <laughs> that I mean it's. Uh, I, uh, and I gave myself permission to be to let it be bad sometimes because I went and I listened to other rec like recordings of live performances of singers and I was like they all struggle with it they yeah. all struggle with it so it's okay and the nights that it was great I'm like yes the nights that it was bad it was like eh. you know <laughs> just just what it it's the, the only it's that last sort of that last 10 minutes of the second act. It's too indietro fuji to the end of the act. It's like, you know, but other than that, the role gives me no problems. But unfortunately, that's right in the middle. That's smack dab in the middle. But you know it and you realize it. And there are so many singers that don't realize it. And yeah. then they get at the end of the night going, why am I so tired? <laughs> But then all of, a, all of a sudden, my voice sounds so fresh when I when I sing um, when I sing the uh, the aria at the end. You know, it just it just feels so fresh, and I'm like, what? Where was that? You know, an hour ago. <laughs> like, where was this voice an hour ago? Can you bring that back? Yeah. Right. So I for me, Harry, it's it's the higher repertoire. So when I go and sing something high again, and I work my voice back up to be high where it's normal, where it's home. Okay. It feels good. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily need to be Mozart. It just needs to be that higher rep that I can just let my voice be in its no, normal place. Peak Dom is never a role for you. No, but you know, I've been asked to do it and I want to do it. I want to do it. But it, oh. Yes, but it's not, it's low, but it's singy. It's, yes. not, it's not barky. It's not low and barky. You know, that's for instance, uh, Parsifal is, sits kind of low, but it's low and it's singy. You know, you get to sing long lyric song, long lyric lines. It's not just you know da 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 over and over again. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like your healthy attitude about the high notes because there's a lot of people that aren't, <laughs> <laughs> and and you can see the mental 
because if they missed it one night, you can see the next night, the fear of God, you know? And so yeah. I really like your, I think more of us should be that way, you know, where like, cause honestly that's our bodies. Some days it's really great. And some days it's really not. And that, and I think young artists need to know that too, that there's not this, yes, we are all striving for perfection, but it's okay if you're not, that there's, yeah. there's okay. and, you don't learn. Again, there's certain, yeah. But there's certain rep, there's certain rep and there's certain things that you go back and listen to your favorites. Right. They all have screwed it up. You know? I love and, it. And it just sort of makes you, it sort of makes you feel a little bit more comfortable yeah. knowing when you, when, when you, when you are, you know, going to listening to those uh, Perleneres, you know, uh, on, on YouTube and just, just, there's some times when I just go and I'm like, I love this guy singing. And yes, he did, he did that. So it's, it up too. Yay, yes, okay. yes. It's it's like okay. Right? We're not What's machines. That? We're not machines. No, no, no. no. And that's, that's, that's the other thing when I teach too, I say, you know, just because, you know, this turn worked great on the D today, but if your voice is a little, is a little, you know, um, low the next day, you have to adjust all of this, maybe like a half step or whole step lower. Right. All these things that you sort of, were sort of working on and fixing and finding, the, this is, this is transfer, like you have to mutate this depending on how you feel on the day. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, What's the best advice you would, you would give young singers now? now that you're teaching as well as being a singer? That's, that's tough because there, there are two, two, two things I would definitely say. You know, one is be yourself. Don't, don't look for, to other people for who you need to be. And, and, and that means you have to have an artistic perspective, whatever that is. If you don't have an artistic point of view, an artistic perspective, no matter how well you sing, it's gonna mean absolutely nothing because you have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important. Um, the other thing is uh, um, to <laughs> know your limitations, you know, know your limitations. And when you find out what they are, be able to, you know, communicate those limitations to people, you know, say, I can't do this because blah, blah, blah. Or I really thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you for asking me to sing Rodimus at 22. But I think that <laughs> I'm going to have to pass now because I want to be able to sing it when I'm 50, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. So you have to be able to, you know, uh, sort of know who you are in that way and be honest about it. And that's the hardest thing for singers because on the other hand, you have to be so full of yourself to do this. You have to be so full of yourself to do this. There is a certain amount of um, arrogance and um, sort of um, self-centeredness, an ego that you need to have to do what we do. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. You have to take care of yourself first. And then that brings me to my third thing, is that opera's about the singer first. So don't let people push you around. Yeah. Because without us, without us, there's no opera. And, I'll pe and all these people keep saying, oh, well, this opera's useless and wasteless and blah, blah, blah. It's not going to, you know, it's, it's dying art form. They've been saying, I, I remember reading something from like 1983 that said opera was dying. <laughs> I, yeah. think it was like, I forget what this famous New York Times critic I can't think of his name, Her Bernheim or something, something one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was like, oh, the singing of today is so horrible. What happened to the singing of the 60s? The same conversation that, they, they, that they're saying about, what happened to the singing of the 70s and the 80s? And, uh, and everybody was so good. You know? well, thank you. We, we're chopped liver, right? Right, thank exactly. You so it's okay. like, what happened to... Can I ask something about that, about that ego? I'm all for a healthy ego, but you better not be an asshole in rehearsal. Like, you there's better a, find there's you. A difference be, there's a difference between having a healthy ego and being an asshole, though. There's True. a big difference. Huge. We have to have a level of confidence yeah. that even that we're saying to ourselves all the time that I'm the best at this at this moment. I need to, and you don't, if you don't feel that way, it's not going to work no matter how well you're singing, right, right, right. How, how, how appropriate it is for you. If you don't feel like you deserve to be there and that's Absolutely. your moment Absolutely. and take advantage of that moment, then it's just not gonna work. No, I totally agree with you there. But I think that there's some singers that take that ego thing to a point where they cross the line and then I'm like, my life's too short to be working with you. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I mean, we've, um, we've all worked with those people. We've all worked with those people. But I, but I think that there's, again, there's a fine line. There's a difference between, there's, there's a difference between having these people 
who are just generally, they, they treat the supers like shit, they treat the chorus yeah. like shit, they treat yeah. the conductor. If something doesn't work right they're in the rehearsal, they, it's the conductor's fault. Right. It's the colleague's fault for the way they touched me. You know, oh my God, he grabbed, I had one colleague that said this one time, okay? He grabbed me too tight on my arm, so I missed my entrance. <laughs> so I went, through, I went through the rest of the rehearsals like this, never, t never touching them. Like, but that's insecurity, and oftentimes yeah. I find it, it's their insecurities that leads yeah. to these. To and, these. And, that, and, that's why it's, and that's why it's important to know your limitations as an artist. You know, that's to my point number two. Know your limitations. Know what you can and cannot do. And once you're honest with yourself about those things, you won't then go blame Carrie Alkema for the way she stepped in front of you, you know, this thing, you know. Oh, the way she touched your face. When right, the way she touched my face, she pulled down, she touched my face too tight and my jaw got tight and then my kind of cracked, you know. <laughs> and I'm going to blame her for everything, yes. Right, yeah, yeah. I was, I was with, in a show, um, with, an, with an aging diva and she blamed everything everybody for everything that went wrong instead of saying you know what i'm past this role now at this point in my life you know i shouldn't be singing this role and everybody in the room knew it nobody was going to say anything yeah but, that's a hard uh, yeah one. it's that's tough a hard one because you have respect for their artistry yes. and for their whole career but at also there's a point where you want to say yeah now and, and i'm sure that's going to happen to me real soon Carrie, you can tell me. And she, and, she, and she treated this conductor, this one particular conductor, like, and he was the sweetest man. And the only thing I could say was, was the, and she would be like, right, Russell? Right, didn't he, blah, blah, blah? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what do you do? Like, wh like, what do you do? And I got a big mouth. So if, if, I thought, if, I thought, <laughs> if I thought that was true, I would totally stick up for you, you know? Oh but I just God. couldn't do that because yeah. everybody in the room knew that it was time for you to hang this one up. Yeah. And you're not only a singer and an actor, you have to be a psychiatrist and a psychologist in this business. I mean. Yes, yeah, yeah. And listen, we all, we all have a little crazy. We all have a little crazy. And, it's, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, own it. Own your shit, yeah. you know? No, I really love that, own your shit. I mean, know what you do well, know what you don't. Right. Um, you know when, admit when you're not prepared. You know what I mean? Right. Apologize. And, and be prepared. But there's no excuse for not being prepared. No, there's not. Even no. though. I I, that's, been, that's been very common lately. That's been very common lately. I've been, seeing, I've been seeing it a lot lately. Going to jobs and people in the room and they just don't know it. Don't you think they're so busy? Yeah, don't I, you think we're overbooked? I mean, it's like job to job to job to job to job. There's not enough. Yeah, we, but we all have that. What's that, Sandra? People don't give themselves time in their schedule to learn. That's true. That's true. I've been guilty of that, but you know what? I learned my shit. I would not show up. I would not show up to a job ever in my life because I think they're going to fire my black ass as soon as I come there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> They're not, they're not gonna let me just figure it out. You know, they're not gonna put me with a coach and let me figure it out. Before I went to Houston, I felt like I wasn't prepared enough uh, with Radames. Um, so I told them, I said, hey, when I get there, I'm gonna need a few, you know, coachings just because um, I'm not that as prepared as I'd like to be. Right. They took, that to, they took that to meaning that I wasn't prepared. And I was like, no, 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 no. Russell's not being prepared means a few words is, is, are missing. You know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm making mistakes on this text. Right. It's not that I don't know it. You know, right. I know it. I can sing it, you know. But um, yeah, so they were like, oh, you're prepared. Why did you say you were not prepared? I said, that's not what I said. I said, I'm not pre as prepared as I'd like to be coming into the rehearsal period. That's it's me. a role you've got to sing in. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's a role that has to be sung and sung. Sung and sung, yeah. Sung. yeah. Is that all one, but it is, yeah. It's, it's, you know. Anyway, it was a great one for me. That was a great one for me. Yeah. Do you mind if we do rapid fire with you? I don't mind at all. Questions? Okay. All right. Um, my first question to you is um, about your kid. So, what do you do that embarrasses him? These days, nothing embarrasses him. He thinks I'm a hero, and I love it. <laughs> I, he thinks I'm a hero. That's the best part of this age. I'm sure when he's like 11, he's gonna be. Could you go away from me now? <laughs> <laughs> but at six, I'm a hero. You're a hero. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so what's your most irrational fear? Bugs, flying bugs. Any kind? Any kind of flying bugs. If they fly, I'm, I will scream. I will scream and run away. 
Yeah. Or never part. allowed to come to my house, Russell. Never if, if, there, if, if, it's, if it's on the floor or something, I feel like I can, if it's crawling, I can like smash it, you know? But if it flies, I'm just like. Okay. Uh, I, I, would <laughs> like, I would like your partner and your mom's phone number because I would like them to video that. <laughs> Put oh. that on a trailer here, right here. Right. <laughs> Russell screaming from a flying roach. Um, oh, what's your most embarrassing mal uh, wardrobe malfunction in during an opera production? Embarrassing w w the wig that they put on me in San, Fr in, 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 uh, San Francisco for Roberto Devereux. <laughs> that wig, a oh, photo of which is horrible. <laughs> It's that wig. When I came, you remember, I came outside, I came on stage, and everyone started slapping at me. And I just took it and I pulled it off of my head. I looked at you and I just said, You've got to be kidding. You've got to be. That was like a small animal that they, it's like a chia pet <laughs> on your head. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was horrible. That, that was the worst thing ever. Okay. Ever. Okay. Um, what's your guilty pleasure? Reality TV, 600 pound life. You, oh, <laughs> I love it. 90 Day, 90 day Fiance, <laughs> those things. <laughs> love that, it. Like that kind of trashy reality TV, yes. Love it, love it, love it. I love you so much. Okay, what is the craziest rumor you've ever heard about yourself? Hmm. Is there one? I don't know if, I don't know if there is one. Okay. Oh. Oh, I, I well, I, well, it wasn't really a rumor that I came out in opera news, but I, I knew I was gay and everybody else did too. Oh. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't come out. You know? but I don't think that was, I don't think that was, that's one. That's, I don't think that's a crazy rumor about myself. I don't know if I heard a crazy rumor about myself. Okay. What was the last thing you Googled? The last thing I Googled. I would never admit um, I Googled today. Uh, uh, hold on. Listen, let me tell you. <laughs> no. Hold on. I, I think I know what this is, but I just want to make sure. Oh, uh, um, uh, plexiglass, uh, pl giant plexiglass so I can teach behind a plexiglass. <laughs> giant plexiglass. Because uh, um, do you guys know Janet Williams, soprano? Uh, mm -hmm. She teaches in Berlin, but she, she showed a, she had like a, you know, one of those shoji screens, but it's all yeah. glass clear. Yeah. And she, was, her, she put it so her students could stand, stand behind it. And sing. Love that. She still had on a mask and and a face covering thingy, but she was be, they were behind us, uh, like six foot, seven foot tall glass sort of shoji looking screen thing. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to for myself for my studio. I love that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, they've actually been teaching over there pretty much the whole time, and they've been making yeah. it work. So it's a really great conversation to have. Yeah. Th this is the thing. I don't think it's as well. I think it's horrible disease and I, as, and, and I think it's killing people. And I, but I think that a little bit of innovation and a whole lot of consistency would help us a lot over here. And there's no consistency and there's no innovation. So um, that's why over in Spain, they're doing Traviata right now, social distance Traviata. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's amazing. Like, have you seen the pictures from it? Yeah, I did, I it's, did. It's amazing. It's an, it's, I have to say, Russell, it scared me a little bit. <laughs> Listen, I, I understand why it would scare you, and it should, it should scare everybody. Yeah. But I think that we can't just stop living our lives. Mm -hmm. And think about the amount of money that, that we're all missing out on. And I mean, not that it's only about the money, but we have bills to pay. I know. I, I have a mother and a son to take care of, you know? Yeah. I think about that, you know? And, not the, and I don't have savings that can last me through the new year. No. Absolutely not. No. So I think it's I think it's important that that opera companies and board and their boards figure out how we can make this work. Sure, you know, yeah, absolutely. Put your thinking caps on, people. Hello, they, get it together, America. And the, and the thing that they always say is, well, they're they're um, they're funded by the state. Yeah, they are. But how many how many times do we have sold out operas anyway? <laughs> Let's be honest. So if we limit, if we limit the, the, you know, the Mets 4,000 seats to 1,500, you know, we could, we could get people in the house. Um, they don't feel like it's financially feasible. And in New York, it may not be financially feasible, given the, how much they have to pay unions, you know. But I think we have to think of some kind of way to make it work. 
No, I heard that to even open the Met doors, it costs them a million dollars. I mean, just a flat million, just to even have the doors open and for us to put an opera on. That doesn't even include the production or anything else like that. Just to... Well, when you have to work with like 20 freaking unions, I guess that's, listen, I, I don't want people to kill me because I'm not a union person, but I think that there's a, there's a, it may, yeah, that's a tough well, situation. No, and, and in America, there's more issues with, with us, with the litigious society and all that kind of stuff. And no yeah. opera company wants to be the first one that infected their whole, you know, staff, crew, yeah. orchestra, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So we've got, we have issues we have to figure out over here. But um, but I, I mean, Madrid really excited me, but it did, it did concern me too, because there are so many performances. Um, I'd really love to know what the safety precautions are, because nobody's really even talked about that. No, but listen, in, in Berlin, they did Rheingold um, in, the, in the car park of the Opera House. Right. Uh, Deutsche Opera. Yeah, they did it at the car park of the Opera House. They, you know, in different cities, they're trying different things. Salzburg is, Salzburg in, in August is putting on two operas yep. in the Grosse Special House, and they're putting, I think, 500 people in the audience, uh, and they're going to find ways to distance the people on stage, you know? Um, I'm, all I'm all for doing anything outside. I will sweat my you-know-what off in any kind of couture you want to put me in. <laughs> they all just need to talk to each other. That's what I feel is lacking, is the lack of communication amongst all the opera houses. Hey, this worked for us. Hey, this didn't work for us. Let's try this. And it, that's what I, I would wish they would all just kind of discuss amongst themselves. But can I tell you what I think a lot of this is about? Mm. Saving money. Yeah, of course it is. Of course Save. it is. If you fire, you know, saving money. of your staff or 80% of your staff and, you know, you don't have to cut the lights on, um, you furlough people and then people, donations are still coming in. You're saving a ton of money, you know, and you're saving a ton of money. But I think while they're saving this money, they need to be finding ways that they can make sure that when they do come back or if they want to really come back in February or March, as most of the American opera companies are considering, that they're prepared, that yeah. they're prepared, that they can actually put on shows. And there's a financial, um, even if, you know, we have to take a pay cut here or there, uh, and everybody has to take the pay cut there, right. you know. It's not just the singers, and oftentimes it's just the singers, and we're always the ones that have to make all the concessions. Yeah, we have to make all the concessions, and no one else is making any concessions but us. Yeah. Well, okay, we need to get together and figure that out. Well, right. at home dealing with COVID. Okay, I ask this of everybody: What is your favorite curse word, and it can be in any language? He has a child at home. Yeah, yeah. I curse all the time. I curse like a sailor. That, that kid, that kid's going to curse a lot. <laughs> that kid's going to curse a lot. Um, it's probably fuck. I just say fuck a lot. Like, okay. I fuck me or fuck this. And yeah. Fuck is the thing. It's the word. Okay. Carrie, what's your favorite, favorite cuss word? Motherfucker. There you go. Yeah. My favorite. So it, it mine? Yes. I don't know. I say shit a lot too, but is that even a cuss word anymore? I mean, yes. Yeah. I say shit. I say fuck that. In my grandmother's house, that would have got you popped in the lips. You know, <laughs> even at even at forty something, that would have got you popped in the lips. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In the church, you know, that was my mom would say, "Do not take the Lord's name in vain." Oh yeah. Oh, that one I got a lot. So. Yeah. So that said, what is your favorite word? My favorite word. I, 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 I want, the first thing I wanted to say was love, but that was the first thing that came to my mind. Like love is, a, is it can sort of fit anywhere, everywhere, however, you know, love. Mm -hmm. Love is a, I mean, right. when, you know, I don't want to get all philosophical, but when people love, with love, people are healed. Like, you know, just think about all the people who were, you know, married for 50 years, their partner passes away, you know, and then a few months later they, they go just because they, that, that separation, that distance. Yeah. yeah. Love, so love is a very special work to me. Oh, yeah. Um, last question. What's the last question? Last question is: If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say as you walk through the pearly gates? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Come back! Come back! Come back! <laughs> No, 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 not this guy. <laughs> like, wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Wesley.
Rachel, honestly, it was so, so much to laugh with you and to just chit chat and catch up. Really yeah. beautiful. It's great to see you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity and just to see your faces and giggle a little bit. And it's good. It's good. Yeah. It's been, I haven't, I, I don't think I'm depressed just yet, but I'm, I'm, sometimes I get on the, on the verge of like, I miss singing. I miss being with people. I miss, yeah. you know, you know that, that's, a, that's a thing. We need it's that. It's a lottery, isn't it? Yeah. It's just, we yeah. all lift each other up when we, when yeah. we're around each other. And, and you know what I'm thinking is that the next time we do get back to work in a normal situation, I pray to God that we all treat each other better yes. in, in the work environment because yeah, we needed to. We really need yeah. it on so many levels. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think again, it's all that the whole thing of love. I think so much, so much can be healed from it um, if people just simply love their neighbors as they themselves. Yeah, that's right. biblical, you know. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy that sort of works. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank y'all. Take Fun. care. Of thank you. Good luck Good. in the fall. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good luck teaching. Maybe we all need to do this again and hear how that all went. I want to hear about all the protective measures you took, Russell. Body yes. common. Body I, common. Body <laughs> common. But I've seen some of those online. Maybe I'll. <laughs> uh, I might just send you one. Thanks for being on Screaming Divas. Here's your body condom. <laughs> <laughs> that, could, that, could be your, that could be your party gift. <laughs> Exactly. Love you so much. I love you guys. Bye. 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 Thanks, Russell. Bye. Of course, listen, not, I get it. Listen, I, I turned 40 and I thought my body was just falling apart. <laughs> I, I mean, it. I was like, I'm like the booty drop and the boob drop is real, man. That that happens. <laughs> I used to, I, I was that guy that would be like, so when singers start talking about acid reflux, I was like, oh, that's just it. Just yeah, whatever. Yeah. Just, and listen, I turned 40 and it's like acid reflux, cords burn, throat. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? Horse all the time. I'm like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. I remember I was in, right after my 40th birthday, I was in, I was in Chicago with Sandra. We were doing Norma. And then I, I will never forget one night I was on stage and she, she just looked at me with this look of fear on her face. And I was looking at her with a look of fear on my face because I felt like nothing was coming out. They just were not doing this. Like, they were not doing this and vibrating. I don't know what was going on, but it happened right after 40. And I, and just, yeah. I had to rethink a lot of things. Yeah. I can't tell you how good it is to see your face. Good to see you too. Super great. Super power. Wonder twins activate. <laughs> Form of, you know? thinking it's like i don't wear lipstick anymore do you especially with masks like you don't need lipstick anymore well it gets all over everything yeah it makes me really sad because i love lipstick now it's all about Ooh. eye makeup Whew. that okay no that that don't work <laughs> um it fix carrie fix yeah right. there it's been a world war. look at us like fussing with our hair always can't help it it's a hot disaster it was okay like just when you flipped it back over, it was looking.